For Kramer Media in Johannesburg, I'm Sane Lamini, Development Strategist Kate Phillip is in conversation with Polity about the Presidential Employment Stimulus Report. So Kate, for the benefit of those who may not know what is the Presidential Employment Stimulus, would you mind breaking it down for us? Sure. The Presidential Employment Stimulus was launched in October last year by the President in a joint sitting of Parliament, and it was part of the response to the economic impacts of the COVID crisis. So it forms part of the wider economic reconstruction and, re and recovery plan. And what it entails was an urgent allocation of 12.6 billion for special employment programs and other forms of support. It actually includes three different elements. Uh, the main component is public employment. There was also some support to job retention, in particular types of enterprises that are partly public, but that also uh, relied on other income streams, like in the sports sector, for example, and cultural institutions. Um, and in the schools, in fact, there was a component of job retention. Um, there was also a livelihood support component. So recognizing that particularly vulnerable categories of self-employed people were also affected. So that included things like uh, vouchers, production input vouchers to subsistence farmers. Um, so there was a livelihood support component as well. Would you mind telling us how this package is helping young graduates like Ngate Gosilinda, who says getting the job at the South African Heritage Resource Agency resulted in her regaining self-confidence? Yes, the employment stimulus includes support across a spectrum of categories of people affected, um, and that includes young graduates. And we know that, you know, for many young graduates, this is an extremely hostile labor market. And after all the efforts of investment of, of time and resources into, into getting their, their qualifications, um, it's a really hard, hard time. So there is a component of graduate support within the stimulus. Um, the biggest program in the stimulus has been the school assistance program. And while the teacher's assistance did not require graduate qualifications, graduates were prioritized within that program. So a lot of graduates were absorbed into the schools as teacher's assistants, but there were a range of other programs focused on graduates. So for example, the Department of Science and Innovation included a range of programs that involved uh, young graduates, um, applying their skills in different ways. Uh, the Department of Public Works and um, Infrastructure also uh, included young professionals in things like the Willis's Wear Rural Bridges program. And so graduates have been incorporated at a range of levels within, within the stimulus. And through this package, Kate, the Municipal Infrastructure Support Agency will capacitate and support 15 municipalities to adopt labor-intensive methods in the delivery of infrastructure maintenance projects. Tell us about that. So the country invests a lot in infrastructure, and obviously mm. infrastructure is very important for both social and economic reasons. Uh, and that investment, we need to optimize the employment outcomes of that. And not all infrastructure, but certain key elements within infrastructure, it is possible to use more labor intensive methods to deliver the same outcomes. And so it's been policy in the country for some time, in fact, um, to support labor intensive methods where those make sense. But that doesn't always happen in practice because it takes a particular skill set to use labor intensive methods and sometimes it's easier to use machines. Um, and so the, the purpose here was a more long term investment in capacitating municipalities to really optimize the employment outcomes of the basic service infrastructure in particular that many of them are investing in. So MISA was supported to capacitate a target of 15 municipalities to do this. And in fact, other municipalities have requested to come on board as well. In the basic education department, I've read that the package was able to provide funding for 27,662 vulnerable teaching posts, usually funded by the governing bodies, but now they were placed at risk by the impacts of COVID-19. Tell us about that. Yes, and in fact, that we've just heard that that number is actually higher. Um, more posts than that, over 30,000 posts were supported. So in fee-paying schools, many fee-paying schools, 
uh, the fees of parents are used to augment teacher capacity, the number of teachers in, in a school. Um, and in the context of COVID, suddenly those jobs were, were placed at risk. Uh, and so the stimulus actually supported fee paying schools to retain uh, those teaching posts during this critical time. You have advocated for the special 350 COVID-19 grant, which was able to help many destitute families. There was a time when you even advocated for the grant to be pushed to 650. Is there a possibility that this will continue beyond the pandemic? Well, as things stand, it is not. <laughs> um, it has not been extended. And I think that that is uh, a a, a policy tragedy, but um, you know, I, I think that the, 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 all the indications are that we still face serious challenges of hunger and that the grant made a real, a real difference. Uh, the systems were put in place despite complaints about how long it took. Actually, it, it was pretty quick to, to roll out a grant to the numbers of people, to the millions of people who did receive it. Um, those systems are there, and so the, the support mechanisms um, are there. I mean, I'm speaking personally on this in my in my personal capacity, but I think that it played a really important part in uh, limiting what is an epidemic of hunger uh, that we're seeing as part of the impact of the economic effects of, of, of the COVID crisis. Under sports, art and culture, the National Arts Council has approved grants in excess of its budget, and it was forced to recall these, creating serious challenges for the sector. I understand that action is being taken against those responsible, and funds have now been reallocated to all approved applicants. Can you briefly tell us about that? Yes, I can't speak for the department on that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think, though, that it's important to understand a little bit of context there as well. I mean, it is, yeah. it, it was very, uh, it affected the sector very negatively, but the context yes. was that the stimulus actually, the intention of the stimulus was to provide substantial support to the creative sector. The budget that the National Arts Council had was I think three times their normal annual budget just for the stimulus to support the sector. And for that, the organization had to really go the extra mile. I know that they worked incredibly hard over the, the December break while other people were on break. They were processing, you know, they had a, a, an allocation of 300 million. They had applications to the value of over 2 billion. And I think one of the things that that shows is firstly how much need there was in the sector, but also how much potential there is for job creation if that sector can get support. The reality is that in the process of processing this vast number of applications, there was uh, a flaw in the management system and they ended up allocating uh, awards to the value of more than their budget. Then what they did was they withdrew those awards, but the people who'd already believed they'd received rewards were then of course very disadvantaged because some of them had appointed people, some of them had entered into contracts. And so there was a lot of outcry in the sector, but the context was one in which the board allocated more awards than their budget, then decided to withdraw the, the awards already made to spread the budget across all who, who, who qualified. It was a really unfortunate, um, uh, outcome uh, in a context where the intention was to really provide a boost to the creative sector. And lastly, Kate, government says job targets contained in the employment stimulus are real and fully funded. We know that 11 billion has been set aside to extend the presidential employment stimulus package to promote youth employment as well as to alleviate poverty. Can people have confidence that this program will fulfill its mandate? Well, I do think that now we're in a position to point to our track record so far. You know, 12 billion was allocated in October. Uh, by March, uh, over 500,000 people had directly benefited uh, in measurable ways in terms mainly of employment opportunities and that's people in post, that's not promises. <laughs> that is people who were in post, who were being paid in the school program. We had uh, you know, over 315,000 young people in post earning the national minimum wage. It made a huge impact in communities across the country. There's not a community in the country that wasn't touched by that program. Um, 
So, you know, I think on the basis of that track record, uh, it, it was a very short time frames in order to roll the program out to, you know, to achieve that scale in just five months, um, uh, I believe is pretty unprecedented actually. Um, and, uh, you know, so we are geared up to extend that into phase two. And so I think people can have confidence that the jobs, that 11 billion is to fund jobs, the jobs are fully funded. I think an expectation that the stimulus will continue to perform um, is a realistic one. That was Kate Phillip in conversation with Quality about the Presidential Employment Stimulus Report.